Please welcome Monsef Belyamani. Thank you. So you just heard about Kavash from uh, Carl, and so I'm going to basically talk about my experience using the tool. Um, just a little uh, background about me. I'm currently fun employed. I'll be joining Code for America in their fellowship program uh, in January. It's basically a Peace Corps for civic-minded geeks. There'll be 29 of us from various backgrounds, um, urban designers, UX designers, web developers. I think I'm the only one with a QA background. Um, and we will, we will be working with um, nine cities to help improve uh, local government and uh, develop open source uh, web applications to address civic needs. And I'm also passionate about music. I used to DJ for about 15 years. That's part of my record collection there. <laughs> and I also enjoy photography. That's um, sand dunes in Merzouga in Morocco, which is where I'm from originally. But most recently, I was uh, working at AOL on the mobile team, um, working on both uh, iPhone, I mean iOS and Android applications. And these are some of the applications I worked on. You might recognize some of them. Um, sometimes when I tell people what kind of applications I've been working on, they didn't really associate certain brands with AOL, like Movie Phone. They didn't know that was AOL or MapQuest, um, Shoutcast. Um, so earlier this year, uh, we, didn't, we never really did anything with automation. And so I was asked to do some research and find out what was out there. And a lot of tools that you heard about um, today, um, I looked at for, like Anteater, Calabash, of course, Phone Monkey. This was back in February or March, and Phone Monkey now is called Monkey Talk. And Frank, uh, Keith, or Kif, uh, Touch Test, UI Automation, and Zucchini. And um, so I kind of had a checklist in mind while I was trying to uh, evaluate the tools. Um, I wanted something that was easy to set up and maintain. Uh, a lot of the tools I tried, actually, I couldn't get to work. Um, and another big thing for us was that they uh, would run on actual devices. Because, um, for example, when we're working on the Editions iPad app, it had a lot of performance issues on the first generation iPad. So we want to be able to test on physical devices uh, without having to jailbreak them. And also, you know, well documented, updated regularly. Uh, that there was a community around it. And also another big thing was, um, because I just started learning Ruby about a year ago, and I was really into the whole Cucumber thing, and having readable tests, and having basically uh, test cases, uh, automation, and documentation all in one. So that really appealed to me. And uh, so I chose Calabash. Um, and so Kalabash, as you heard from Carl, is, you know, the scripts are run in Ruby, so uh, Ruby comes installed on most Macs, but it's an older version, uh, 1.87, I think, and uh, I recommend using the latest version, which is 1.9.3, I think, as of now. Um, and while I was uh, playing with setting up my machine, this was earlier this year, I think on um, Snow Leopard and maybe Lion, I ran into a lot of issues, uh, so I spent a lot of time figuring out why I was getting these errors while I was um, setting up my Mac for a development environment. And so I wrote this um, very detailed tutorial. Um, let's see. This is, it's on my website, monsefbellumani.com. And it goes through installing Xcode um, or the standalone command line tools, home, Homebrew, Git, RVM, which are the, the recommended setup. Um, and it's very detailed, has screenshots and everything. And since I posted it um, in early April, I think it's been viewed now 50,000 times or more, um, which tells you how many people are actually interested in Ruby and probably Ruby on Rails and finding these uh, problems that I have uh, listed on here. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot much better on Mountain Lion. Uh, the process is much easier now. Um, you can skip a lot of the steps. You don't have a lot of the errors. but I did find an issue recently with um, a certain combination, I think 10.8.2 uh, and Xcode 4.5, where you had to run some additional commands with Homebrew to get everything to work. Um, so if you're just starting off um, and you're interested in using a tool that uses Ruby like Calabash, I recommend going through my tutorial. Um, it'll get you all set up. 
And then um, in the GitHub repository for Calabash, I know Carl uses RBENV, which I haven't uh, tried, but I'm using RVM, so that's what I'm recommending. So if you use RVM, I recommend creating a gem set. Basically, it's like an isolated environment where you can just have the Calabash gem so you don't have to worry about conflicts with other Ruby applications that you might be running on your uh, Mac. And so as you heard from uh, Carl, Calabash tests are made up of feature files, the cucumber part, and then the step definitions, which are in Ruby. So I'm not gonna go over the same thing. Basically, this is the template for features. Um, so one thing that's great about Calabash is it comes with predefined uh, steps that you can use. So you don't have to know Ruby really to start using it. So if you're just trying to see what it can do, you can actually write something like this and it comes with a bunch of predefined steps that allow you to say something like, then I wait to see you know, a certain, the name of a certain button, or then I fill in if it's a text field, or then I touch for certain UI elements. But the problem with this is you know, it results in fragile tests, so even though you can do this, it's not recommended. Uh, it's better to rewrite it so that it's readable um, by everybody on your team using the language for your application. So this is an example of something that you should be doing. And so once you write it in English like this, you will have to create custom step definitions in Ruby that match these custom steps that you just written. And so this is an example of a step definition where you can actually uh, use uh, the predefined steps, such as I touch password or I fill in password, and just add the macro part of it so you don't actually need to know the Ruby methods that actually perform these actions. Um, so, and Ruby is kind of easy to learn, it's readable as well. Um, so even if you don't have a you know, programming background, you can still come up with these kind of custom set definitions and then of course add some kind of logics. And this is basically just um, taking the first part, the logging part, which you can separate it out into uh, one reusable step definitions that you can use in other uh, tests that require you to log in. And another great thing about Calabash is that it's very easy to update. So there's two parts uh, that you can update. There's the gem itself, which is the, the Ruby part, and that's very easy, it's just this command. And then there's the um, framework, which is the part that embeds in your application. And actually I also have I wrote a blog post about um, Calabash and how to step by step, even though this is also covered in the documentation, um, but I thought I would do it as well on my own. So it goes through how to integrate the app, uh, Calabash with your app. And so one thing uh, at AOL, a lot of our um, applications, our, a lot of our iOS apps were um, using SVN. We just recently started using Git. And so with SVN, what happens when you use this easy command to update the framework, it doesn't work with SVN because SVN tracks every folder basically and so you have to go through, and I've been meaning to report this issue but maybe this can be something that can be uh, updated so that instead of replacing the whole folder, it just replaces the files that need to be replaced. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and you can also use this command to verify that you're running the latest framework once you're running the, uh, the app on the simulator. And as mentioned uh, on the GitHub documentation, sometimes when you update everything, uh, the simulator doesn't know about it, so you might need to reset content and settings. There's an option in the simulator uh, just to be safe. And also another thing to keep in mind and I think I have a yeah, screenshot. Uh, basically, when new files are added, when you're working with developers and they keep checking in code, in iOS, it's usually .m and .h files, make sure to check the, um, the history of the commits and then check which new files have been added and then click on all the .m files and then on the right-hand side in the inspector, a target membership because uh, the way Calabash works, basically you create a separate target in your iOS app so you make sure that it's selected Otherwise, when you try to run the app or in the simulator, it, it will fail because there are some files that are missing. Um, 
And also one thing I've noticed is, I'm not sure if this is still an issue, uh, the last time I tried it was probably a few months ago, was that swiping depends on device orientation. So, uh, and it depends on the position of the um, home button. So if you have an app that works in both landscape and portrait and you wanna swipe from right to left and then you rotate uh, and then you want to swipe from right to left, this is actually a swipe down motion because it's going towards the home button. Um, so I just had to introduce some logic in my scripts to take that into account. And, and I know that um, it was fixed at one point, I think, um, but last time I tried it, it wasn't working, so I just had to add that in my scripts just to take that into account. And also another thing to keep in mind is that you can only touch visible items, so for example, if you're uh, trying to touch an item that's further down on the screen, you have to write a script that basically keeps scrolling until it sees that element and then you'll be able to touch it. Um, but another, uh, that was an exception, there are certain things you can find out, um, even if they're not visible, for example, you can uh, find, you can, um, there's a command where it'll tell you the total number of uh, cells or rows in a table view. So you can use that if you ever need to find that out. And then you can scroll to a cell even if it's not visible. So if you only have five cells visible at once, you can scroll to cell 20, for example. But to actually touch it, it has to be visible on the screen. And just a general tip is to use, uh, because a lot of the commands uh, that Calabash uses are kind of long to type out, so you can use um, aliases, you know, .bash profile, which is, um, just basically a file that gets called every time you launch a new terminal window or a tab, and you can create a bunch of uh, aliases. So for example, all these are the, the Calabash ones I have here. So for GUC, for gem update Calabash Cucumber, you can just create basically shortcuts for long commands that you run all the time. And another thing, and this is, I'm not sure if this is standard or because I'm not an iOS developer, but um, in the TechCrunch iPad app, uh, over here on the top left, when you're viewing an article, it creates a dynamic um, uh, explore uh, tag cloud that grabs, tries to identify companies that are talked about in the article, and so you can find out more about the various companies. And so to be able to automate the, the touching each of these uh, squares, obviously since the, the title changes depending on the article, the, the actual uh, label for the buttons has to stay the same. And so what I did is I just created an accessibility label for each of these, and it's called top right, bottom left, uh, and main, for example. And then uh, to have it not actually say the name of the label when a person uh, ha is using VoiceOver on an iPad app, for example, I found that you could use um, this uh, method right here, setting accessibility elements hidden to yes, and that way when you tap it, it uh, doesn't say the name of the label. But, but obviously this only works in some, it's just because the uh, buttons themselves are large enough that there's space for you to tap outside of the actual text. So that's just the workaround I used. But if anybody has you know, better solutions, I, I'm assuming you could probably uh, create a, a, a separate class for these buttons and then in Calabash you can use the index of the buttons and maybe that's a better approach. And so one of the things Carl mentioned, and I think I can try to give you a demo, this is one of the great things I like about Calabash, is that you can experiment. So let's just run this. And this is just an open source app uh, for, it's a hacker and user reader app. And so, oh, sorry. Not in the right. There you go. All right. So 
For example, if you wanted to see the labels of all the tab bar buttons, you could just use label tab bar button, and it shows you their home, new profile, search, and more. And if you wanted to tap one of them, you just say um, tap profile, for example, and it goes there. Um, let's see, and you could also, what else do I have on here? You can, you can, um, I guess that one didn't work because there was no, uh, but you can just query the whole view and it'll dump out everything that's on the view so you can find out more if you want to dig in into all the different buttons and whatnot. Um, and then also have a script. So this is something new that Carl added. A lot of us in the Google group, there's a great Google group where so you can find out a lot of uh, information sometimes even before it's uh, the documentation is updated so one, one of the things that many of us are trying to do is come up with a script that uh, basically taps each of the cells in a table view all the way down whoops and then um, goes back and taps the next cell so originally what we we're trying to do is figure out the total number of cells and then divide it by the number that are visible at any given time, which actually this app, it could change because uh, the height changes depending on how much text there is, so it's a little tricky. Um, and what happened was sometimes, let's say if you scrolled all the way down, you, you notice how the top one is, is not fully visible, and so that caused some problems with trying to tap uh, each, each cell, we were trying to use the index of the cell basically whenever each set of cells was visible. And so he just added a new way to do that and I think I have it here. Um, I forget what the... Uh, And there it goes. And, and the other thing is when you reach the bottom, all the way at, at the bottom, if you're trying to, you, 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 if, you, if, you, if you're left with five cells at the bottom and you're trying to scroll to one of those last five cells, it doesn't actually, it can't put them up at the top of the screen because you're at the end. Um, and so what this new method does is actually allows you to tap on them even though they're not actually uh, at the top and you don't have to worry about uh, the index or whether they're partially visible or not. And so this should continue working all the way down to the bottom. See, so now it's reached the bottom and see now it's touching all of them. And so that was something that came out of a discussion on the Google groups. And so that just shows you how you know responsive Carl is and he's great. And actually when I first started using the tool, I just had some questions about setting it up and everything he would you know, answer in a few minutes. And that's another great thing about Calabash is the whole you know, support and ecosystem around it. Yeah, so I just, as I mentioned, you know, that's the, um, a key thing is to participate in the Google group. You'll find lots of tips and see how other people are uh, using the tool and what kind of uh, you know, custom scripts they've come up with. And actually there's a section in the, on the GitHub repo on the wiki where you can find uh, all kinds of uh, custom steps that people have contributed. I've contributed one that basically, I thought it was generic enough that anybody could use it in an app that um, allows you to swipe to delete, for example, like TechCrunch, for example, uh, allows you to save articles to bookmark them for reading later. And so when you go to the saved articles view, you can swipe to delete them. And so I just wrote a script that basically goes through each of them and deletes them. Um, and also another trick is that this is new in the GitHub for Mac application. Um, any repository that you're watching, and this is only on Mountain Lion, I think, um, you'll, you'll get notifications whenever a new commit occurs. So if you're always watching something, it's uh, you know, a great way to keep up to date instead of having to check the website every time to see if something new has been added. Um, and so, uh, from my experience, 
working on this, I have some uh, recommendations for teams who want to basically explore this tool. And, well, the biggest one is that uh, you dedicate a full-time uh, engineer because I, actually I was working on it you know, off and on uh, because we just had so many apps we were working on, I could never focus on it 100%. And I think it's definitely worth it because the payoff in the long run is, is great to have to be able to run regression tests and not spend a lot of time doing manual testing. And also work with developers to make the apps accessible. A lot of times I had to do things on my own and uh, the views weren't really uh, didn't have any labels, so I just had to guess the index, basically trial and error to find out what the index was to be able to scroll or swipe on a certain view. And then um, as uh, Pete mentioned, uh, the whole continuous integration, I haven't really played around much with that uh, with Kalabash, but it'd be great you know, if Pete and uh, Carl could uh, work together and come up with a solution, or if anybody has uh, found something that worked for them, I'd, be, I'd love to hear about it. And then uh, also uh, contribute fixes, however small they might be, custom steps, and even if you don't have a programming background, you can also contribute to open source applications just by updating documentation, or uh, providing translations, those are very helpful as well. And so that was it, and this is uh, my contact info. And I'll be uh, sharing the slide as well. Uh, anybody have any questions? Um. If you have uh, experience uh, real device testing using uh, Calabash, would you like to share uh, what is your uh, experience uh, real device testing? Is there any difference between uh, simulator testing and you know, device testing? Or Not really, it's, uh, it's actually great because you can run multiple tests on multiple devices at the same time. You just open up different terminal windows or tabs and uh, because basically it uses the IP address of your device and so you can have multiple tests running on different devices or you can have, maybe you have a set of tests that runs in portrait mode and another one landscape, so you can do that. Um, and we found it really helpful when I was basically just writing scripts just to see what the uh, tool could do. And so a lot of the scripts I wrote were just kind of like performance testing. Um, and we found a lot of actually performance bugs doing that, just, and especially running on older devices like the first generation iPad you know, which, are, which is a lot slower. Um, but in terms of differences, I didn't see any, and, and it's just great to be able to run on actual devices, because that's what people are using. I was just wondering, did you have to try Calvish Android also? Did you have a team? No, I haven't. I've only been able to try on iOS. I mean, that was one of the goals, is to be able, because one of our you know, checklist items was cross-platform compatibility, and uh, I just never got the time to try it on Android. Yeah. Do you have some tips about verification? For example, in your example, you tap different articles and open the pages. So what is better to verify that the page opened correctly? Excuse me, what was the last part? Uh, what, what do you use for, to verify that the page opened correctly? What exactly, browser, I don't know, title, body of the page? Um, you, well, this, this, these are mostly native applications that we were testing um, for TechCrunch. It has some, I guess, web elements as well. Um, but mostly, most of the scripts I was, uh, was writing was basically just to see what the tool could, could do, uh, to see how swiping works and that kind of stuff. So I wasn't doing a lot of the actual verification. Um, it's just basically just experimenting just to get a feel for the tool. Um, but there are uh, methods you can use to wait for certain elements to appear. So I was using that kind of verification. You know, you can look for anything, whether it's a title of an article or well, actually not in that case because it's dynamic. But yeah, basically waiting for a certain UI element that's consistent, that's not dynamic to appear. Um, yeah, that's uh, right, because we are testing just for verification, right? That's why I'm asking <laughs> about verification point. 
Yeah, basically you're just looking for some object on the page and verify if it exists, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is very interesting. Is there any scenario you want to test but cannot cover by Calabash? There is, so, so Edition is a good example. Uh, I don't know if you've tried this in iPad apps, basically a newsreader. And it's very, a lot of our apps have custom uh, UIs and, uh, you know, just, I guess the, the, the mobile team did things differently and Different apps work differently as well, but additions was one of the hardest ones to automate because uh, you have um, basically different layouts. You have different sections of articles, like you know, business, technology, top news, or whatever, and um, and the layout is uh, pulled in from some server, and it. I'm not sure how it defines how it's going to appear, but and on one page, you might have you know, four articles like in a kind of square format, or you might have one long one and then two small ones to the side of it. So nothing is really consistent. And none of the, uh, and plus it's all dynamic, so there's nothing consistent between each article uh, cell that you can use. And so I was just trying to see if you could actually do something with it, and so I came up with this really like convoluted using um, X and Y coordinates and to try to guess, uh, well I used the query tool first of all just to find out the, the class of all the different um, article parts and uh, so I knew what I wanted to touch and then I knew that each element was you know, a certain number of pixels below something else like the title for example and so I got it to work in some situations but it was not consistent so I guess there are some apps that are going to be a little harder to automate, or you'll just have to work with the developers to see if they can somehow uh, create a, a label, accessibility label, or something that can actually work with the tool. Okay, um, just, uh, just curious, like how many scenarios, how many features you have tested by Calabash? How many features have we tested with Calabash? Yeah, yeah. how many scenarios? Maybe 100? Oh, um, it was basically just f going from app to app. So I think the most time I spent was with TechCrunch. Um, not that many, probably less than 50. Yeah. That's the challenge, you know, when you're not dedicated 100% to it, you can't focus all your time. So that's why I really recommend, you know, 100% automation engineer. All right. Thank you, Monsef. Yeah.